Another unfortunate casualty to tide of time, insane asylums. I lament their loss not only as brokerage houses for the breadth and depth of human psychosis, but also I shall mourn the disappearance of that peculiar environment present only in an insane asylum. That palpable atmosphere of blistered brains and churning bowels, the odiferous melange of freely flowing bodily humors, that gently rolling cacophony of distant sobs and screams, the muttered cursing at perceived enemies, and the blissful gurgling of the lobotomized, like a newborn babe discovering the sky. Hmm. Eh. I shall still find test subjects as surely as I find bloody sustenance in the night, but this climate, I fear, may never be replicated. <laughs> Often I reflect with great regret on the missed opportunity that was my infector. Had I been conscious after the attack, I could have stopped the orderlies from locking her in the roaming pen. What I would give for just one interview, a few simple questions of the plague-ridden woman who met her end that dawn. Of course, there is no guarantee she would have been any more helpful than my current crop of test subjects, mewling wretches. 
Few could be called enthusiastic. Given the nature of the tests, I cannot expect the same fervor from all, but a modicum of cooperation would be appreciated. Animals. The one called John went so far as to gnaw off his arm and escape into the floorboards like some feral rodent. I still hear him scurrying about at night. He must be making an atrocious mess in there. My studies proceed at a languid pace. I'm mired in a foul ennui as my wife's illness advances. My subjects grow restless without proper supervision, but I cannot pull myself back from this black depression. How many nights I've wasted now, gazing from the tower walk, pondering the frailty of existence. After decades of solitary study into this affliction, I have learned that it is by no means mine alone. Indeed, the city is home to an entire society of similarly afflicted individuals with whom I've only recently made contact. 
They are an understandably standoffish sort, by and large, but I have been able to confirm with them that the condition is indeed vampirism, which apparently comes in a multitude of strains, each with a spectacular set of symptoms such as invisibility and even a sort of lycanthropy. Through numerous official interactions with the governing body of this secret society, I have concluded that their fundamental understanding of the vampiric condition is woefully lacking and mired in suspicion and pseudo-religious dogma that would make a Turk balk for its strictures. Indeed, they seemed impressed with my studies and the eloquence with which I was able to present them. Apparently, the typical sufferer of my particular strain of vampirism is far from the vanguard of the King's English. So impressed were they that they even offered me an office in their government, a rather high office by the sound of things, I believe I shall accept. If nothing else, it should provide a lofty vantage point from which to observe the breadth and epidemiology of the affliction so that I may move more expeditiously toward a cure. I have accepted the role of Primogen for Clan Malkavian, the dreadfully winsome label applied to the particular strain of vampirism I suffer, so named for some supposed vampire father figure of old, more poppycock grown from a backward culture that seems interminably drawn to children's tales and the fiction of Victorian romance when it should concern itself with the science behind their suffering. No matter for I have taken this office for no greater reason than to advance my research. I must make mention, however, that even among my would-be peers in this governing body of vampires, the level of paranoia and superstition is frightening. Their intelligence is not the question, no, indeed. As they courted me for this appointment, I had to suspect that their overtures were hand tailored to what must be my obvious infatuation with reason, for the devil would do well to have such honey-tongued tempters. Even so, I could not help but notice the dressing of language these vampire leaders chose for their siren song. Whether it is born of habit, from addressing their unwashed, ill-educated subjects, or from their own deep-seated beliefs, 
Their linguistic flourishes belie a faith in superstition over the providence of empirical reason that must be an all-pervasive theme in this society of darkest night. Damn it all, now I'm doing it too.
As I expand my dealings with the vampire government, I have encountered a disturbing new symptom of this affliction. Frequently, in conversation, I will hear voices emanating from other vampires, voices that are not their own, but which seem to have insight into their lives beyond what I could gather from simple conversation. These voices seem to echo from deep within my fellow vampires, and I cannot be certain if this symptom belongs to my strain of the illness or theirs. For the voices are various and inconsistent. I dare not mention this symptom to my vampiric peers, for they have proven themselves true predators to whom I could be loath to reveal any sign of weakness. Indeed, these voices have counseled me against confessing their presence, and until I can confirm their source, I will listen. The information the voices have given me ranges from curious to frightening. The latter case is especially true of one powerful vampire whose name I shall not commit to recording in the interests of self-preservation.
The voices have increased in frequency and direction of late. They have begun to stay with me long after conversation has ceased and are serving as quite a distraction. I fear others are beginning to notice my preoccupation at the vampire gatherings. I am thinking again of the particular vampire of whom I spoke previously, who I dare not name for my growing fear. If the voices are to be believed, then my caution is warranted, for they speak of his blackest crimes, both past and future. More than once, I have seen the suspicion in his eyes and heard the distrust in his voice when speaking with me. The fear must register on my face, as it is all I can do in these moments to keep from crying out in chorus with the voices.